started and um, welcome everyone to our weekly orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Uh, today we are, uh, we have the privilege of having a very special guest, um, Dr. Jeffrey Katz. Um, so in collaboration with the CCMBM, um, we'd like to thank Dr. Alliston and Pu Yi uh, for helping to coordinate this. Um, they had planned to bring Dr. Katz out um, for a seminar, which he gave yesterday, uh, which was very well received. Um, he's had an opportunity to meet with a number of um, our group and others. Um, and then um, luckily we were able to coordinate this. So he was able to speak to us today. So um, thank you, Dr. Allison. And um, thank you, Dr. Katz for making this work. Um, Dr. Katz is a rheumatologist by training, um, did his undergraduate at Princeton uh, Medical School um, at Yale and residency at Yale before um, doing a fellowship at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, oops, somehow, there we go. Um, thanks. And, uh, and then he's been on faculty uh, at Brigham and Women's um, since then. And uh, he's currently a professor in medicine and orthopedic surgery at the Harvard Medical School. Um, he is a rheumatologist, uh, continues to see patients and then is a very active um, clinical researcher. Um, he directs the um, Orthopedic and Arthritis um, Center for Outcomes Research um, and is a prolific um, leader in musculoskeletal research. Uh, I think he's uh, his H index is over 125. He has like 5,000 citations a year, approximately, uh, probably underselling it a bit, but um, his uh, research is continuously published in our highest impact journals across medicine. Um, and he's had a number of different uh, research areas that have really changed the way that we practice. Uh, Dr. Katz will be speaking to us today on the management of meniscus tears in middle-aged and older adults. Um, but thank you, Dr. Katz, for being here and look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, um, Drew and Tamara and Ted and to um, all of you. I've had such a wonderful time. It's been a great, a great visit. I think um, we've all sort of forsworn travel and are starting to resume it. And um, boy, it's been really fun to kind of um, renew old friendships and to meet some new people. So I've really, really enjoyed this and I'm so, so honored to be here. So. Um, um, so, gosh, for anybody who did see my talk yesterday, this will be a repeat. So, <laughs> here it's okay to to check your your emails. But if you <laughs> if you haven't, I hope this will be interesting. I um, this is a topic that I've been thinking about for um, a long time, and I think we're still a long way from figuring out. But hopefully, I can provide some insights that will be useful. Um, I'm mostly supported by grants from NIH plus one industry grant that um, seems to have its own its own mind. Um, uh, uh, and I don't think any of these sources of support um, are pose any conflict. So, so I'll start in sort of a grand runs, you know, kind of tradition with a case of a 55 year old with a few years of mild to moderate um, activity related knee pain, who then over an eight week period develops um, more localized pain medially worse with certain activities like pivoting, um, uh, non steroidals are not helping all that much. The person is starting to have to give up valued activities and so seeks care and on exam has medial joint line tenderness and a small cool effusion. And so, um, and, and this is a presentation that I think is probably familiar to many people in this room and that occurs over a million times a year in, in our country. And the question that is raised is whether the person should be managed with physical therapy, with surgery. Um, uh, and um, even today, after really a lot of um, work in this area, there are 400,000 arthroscopic partial meniscectomies done in precisely, precisely this situation every year in the US. So, um, so, so let's start by just thinking about the meniscus as a structure, and I'll pose the question of whether it serves as friend or foe. Um, and uh, on the one hand, it provides really important stability and load bearing, and there are um, biomechanical models generally in cadaver studies that showed that, um, and these are some of the data on the lower right here, that in different, this was a cadaver study that looked at um, the amount of pressure borne by the subchondral bone at different phases of the gait cycle. And um, as we go from left to right, we have an intact meniscus and then smaller, medium, and then larger tears. Um, 
and then in the context of meniscal repair and partial um, partial meniscectomy. And you can see that where the pressures really go up is in the context of partial meniscectomy. So there, um, these data are about 15 years old. They're from HSS. And there are a number of studies like this that um, provide some sort of advanced warning that, um, that meniscal um, disrupting the meniscus surgically may lead to uh, increased pressures and perhaps other sequelae. Um, and, um, and of course, there are clinical data going back many, many years suggesting that complete meniscectomy is associated with early uh, changes described by Fairbanks, you know, 75 years ago. And, and, um, uh, and so I think this is a, a theme that, that we've been aware of. Um, on the other hand, um, meniscal tear is at least felt to be a common source of pain activity limitation and um, mechanical or sometimes described as meniscal symptoms like clicking, popping, catching, and giving way. And I'll, and I'll have more to say about this in a couple of slides about how specific the attribution of these mechanical symptoms is to the, to the meniscus. But that certainly is part of what we all as clinicians learn is that you, you listen for those symptoms to try to detect the uh, in, imposition of um, meniscal tear on somebody who, who might have a chronic osteoarthritis. We know that um, meniscal tear is highly prevalent in community settings that generally these tears are asymptomatic, that people who have established OA, um, the great majority have meniscal tears on MRI, um, and that those folks with OA who have meniscal tear have no more or less pain than those who do not on average. And here's some data um, gathered by um, our um, colleague Martin England when he was spending time in the Boston area. In, so this is a Framingham, Massachusetts community-based study of adults who were sort of chosen randomly in the community and they underwent MRI. And um, this uh, depicts the prevalence of meniscal tear in men and women by um, three different age groups. And you can see that as folks get older, meniscal tear becomes more common. It's generally more common um, in, uh, <laughs> sorry, Keep my eye on this. It's generally more common in men than um, than in women, and um, and and the, the vast majority of these individuals in the community did not have um, knee pain. So, if we return to the patient that I presented a couple slides ago, the questions that I'll sort of try to pursue here is: Does arthroscopic partial meniscectomy relieve pain, improve function? Does it accelerate OA progression, as the biomechanical studies suggest that it might? Um, is um, physical therapy of value? Does it add anything to a home-based program? Does having PT in the clinic add anything to a home-based program? Is it any more valuable than simply a placebo? So I'll start this story um, in the um, early 2000s. This is the study of Mosley, which is a well-recognized study for folks who are kind of interested in this area of arthroscopy um, of the knee and osteoarthritis. Mosley, Bruce Mosley is an um, orthopedic surgeon who um, was practicing in Houston at the Houston VA. He collaborated with a very good research group to randomize a couple hundred subjects to either get um, lavage debridement or simply um, sort of skin uh, incisions. Um, they all were admitted overnight as with the tradition then. Um, they, um, upon unmasking two years later, um, patients had no more than a random um, accuracy in um, whether which arm they were randomized to. So it was a very successful randomized control trial. And as you can see from the, from the sketch, the three groups improved in the first several weeks. Um, didn't change over the next two years, and there was no difference whatsoever um, in these groups. Sandy um, Kirkley, um, um, uh, who many of you um, who are um, um, a, a little bit older may remember, is an incredibly promising, wonderful um, sports-oriented orthopedic surgeon at um, McMaster, I think, who, who died tragically in a train accident. So this study was in a, a plane accident. So this study was published posthumously. Her study was published posthumously posthumously, but it was a somewhat similar design to the Mosley study, also published in the New England Journal, also a negative study. So by the time um, the Mosley and Kirkley studies were published in the mid-2000s, it was pretty clear that arthroscopy was probably not a very good treatment for osteoarthritis per se. But the, 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 the problem or the, 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 the issue um, um, that that, that, that was apparent to, to me and colleagues that I was 
talking with at the time was that um, is that arthroscopy is generally not done for OA. It's generally done for meniscal tear and was continuing to be done at a very high rate. So I'll just pause for a minute and go back to one of the questions that I raised a little bit earlier, which is, um, is um, you know, when, when we see people with knee pain, middle age, one of the things we're sort of listening for um, in, in hoping to identify a meniscal tear, because we can do something about a meniscal tear um, short of a knee replacement, um, is whether people have these meniscal symptoms. And so this is um, some data that um, uh, I have worked with Liz Matskin, so who many of you in the sports area will know is a very accomplished sports surgeon at the Brigham. Um, the first author um, uh, is um, was one of our residents, Dr. Farina, and um, and so um, so what we see here is that um, when we look at uh, people in Liz's database who had either no tear, a stable tear, or an unstable tear like a flap or a bucket handle, that the uh, frequency of catching or locking increased. Um, the frequency of grinding, clicking, and popping did not. And so this provided, we thought, some evidence that maybe, you know, a meniscal tear is associated with these symptoms. In the same data, though, we also looked at the outer bridge uh, classification of cartilage damage at arthroscopy from none on the left to most severe on the right. And you can see that those same symptoms of catching and locking are also travel in a dose-dependent way with the extent of cartilage damage. And in fact, when we did more kind of sophisticated analyses to try to disentangle whether these symptoms were more closely related to meniscal tear or to cartilage damage, they were more closely related to cartilage damage. So, um, so this is perhaps a little disquieting, <laughs> we thought so, but I think it's worth sharing that, um, you know, one of the foundational principles of trying to select people for meniscal surgery is those who have meniscal symptoms. And we may really be a sort of, um, you know, misperceiving those symptoms as related to meniscus when they in fact may just um, be reflecting um, osteoarthritis and some of the um, surface incongruities that can occur that might be producing these symptoms. In any case, um, during the um, decade that started in the late 2000s and ended about 10 years later, there were a number of studies that uh, randomized controlled trials, rather well done trials, I think, that compared arthroscopic partial meniscectomy with either um, the comparators were either an exercise program, a PT program, um, or in two cases, sham um, arthroscopic uh, partial meniscectomy. And, um, and, um, and I'll, I'll show you these studies a bit at a time. This is just sort of, excuse me, sort of an overview, but I'll, I'll call your attention just to the rightmost column that um, a large proportion of patients um, in these studies, generally ranging from about 20 to 30 odd percent crossed over from PT to surgery. So in other words, those that were assigned to the non-operative arm crossed over and had surgery. So um, this is a, the first um, of, of that group from Sylvia Herland, who's a physical therapist in Stockholm, worked with um, an orthopedic group in Stockholm and randomized people to either uh, have APM with physical therapy or physical therapy alone. It was a small study um, and um, she followed them um, uh, in her first publication out to about a year and then out to five years. And you can see there's essentially no difference in the intention to treat analysis between those who received surgery in red and those who received a non-operative therapy in blue. And there was a 28% crossover. So this is pain on the left and Ku's function on the right. Um, Kim and colleagues is a South Korean group that um, had a very similar um, design. They're looking at um, pain on the left with lower scores being better and a functional scale on the right. Um, again, the um, uh, um, two um, curves are sort of indistinguishable. Um, and in this particular case, there was no um, crossover, interestingly. GoFan is the one of these studies that actually showed an advantage to surgery in the intention to treat analysis. Um, the surgery is blue, the non-operative is in um, orange. It's about a 10-point um, difference in Coos pain, which is a clinically important difference, and it was statistically significant. Kiza is um, an investigator in southern um, Denmark who did a really nicely uh, executed study, same sort of design, um, uh, APM versus um, exercise, um, with very little difference between the two groups. In each of these studies, there's this, there's this brief advantage for surgery that tends to um, that tends to resolve over time. This is Van de Graaff is a Dutch study, um, a large study, 320 patients. Um, again, very similar um, 
uh, findings, uh, very little difference between the two groups in the intention to treat analysis. And again, with a 29% crossover. Um, these are the Meteor data, which is the study that, um, that our center led. It was a seven center study with a very similar theme. The surgical um, group is red, lower is better here. So you can see the surgical group is doing a bit better at um, three and six months. The groups are indistinguishable by um, 12 months, and I'll show you 60 month data in a little while, and they continue to be indistinguishable. There was here, as there was in so many of the studies that I've shown you, a high crossover rate. So 30% of the subjects who were randomized to PT crossed over and had surgery. Um, and this is a very nicely done meta analysis of many of these um, studies that um, examined um, differences. Um, I think the outcome is pain in the top set um, are all of the studies that they were able to meta-analyze in the bottom set is those who had um, no, did not have osteoarthritis, meaning that the entry criteria were KL0 or one, but not KL2. And you can see that, that the black diamond depicts the summary um, that, that in, you know, on average in the intention to treat analysis, there's a very slight advantage to surgery. It's statistically significant because now the sample size is several hundred. It's only about a third of a standard deviation, um, which is a fairly small effect size. So um, maybe I'll pause there and just show you the, the sort of anatomy of the meteor trial and just, and just um, um, explicate for a moment the what we mean when we say intention to treat, because it is really important in interpreting these data. So, so we randomized 350 people in seven centers to either the PT arm or the APM, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy surgical arm. And at the moment of randomization, those groups are precisely balanced. They're balanced with respect to things we can measure like age, KL grade, WOMAC score, et cetera. And then by virtue of the mechanism of randomization, they would also be perfectly balanced in terms of things we didn't measure and that may be hard to measure, um, such as the patient's resilience, resilience and robustness and sense of optimism and their expectations of success. Those would all be balanced precisely. And that's really the magic of randomization. And the reason that we do as the primary analysis, this is really an industry standard, the intention to treat analysis as the primary analysis, because it says, you know, you, you, if you're randomized to PT, then you get analyzed in the PT group. And if you're randomized to surgery, you get analyzed in the surgery group, irrespective of what happens down the road, whether you got the intervention or not, whether you crossed over or not. And you can see here in Meteor that if we go down the left arm, the PT patients, about a third of them, 68 out of 177, did elect to cross over and have surgery um, so that the um, results in the surgical arm are represent this mixture of people who were randomized to PT and uh, only received PT and those who were randomized to PT and got surgery. And similarly in the operative arm, 10 subjects, it turns out, didn't get surgery. So anticipating this problem, one of the things that we did and that I think many investigators will do if they can appreciate that, that there are crossovers, the crossovers are clinically meaningful, right? We can interpret them. If somebody um, chooses to cross over at six months, it's generally, um, and, and we showed this in our data, because they weren't doing well and they went to talk with their um, surgeon about what their options might be and, and, and they elected to cross over. So, so we created a priori um, an outcome that said that you know in each of those groups, um, you will be deemed a success if you improve by more than 10 points on your whose pain score, a clinically important difference. And um, if you, oh, sorry. Um, and there must be something about the way that I saved this and put it on its auto because it happened yesterday also, but it's keeping me on my toes. Um, and so, um, uh, um, and so, so, um, um, uh, so if you improve by more than eight points on the WOMAC, we did it a couple different ways, and you did not cross over, we described you as a success, otherwise you were a failure. So from that point of view, shown in the kind of reddish brown, 76% um, of the surgical patients were deemed a success, and only 54% of the non-operative patients, because again, 30% of them crossed cross over. And so, um, so, so from that point of view, and, th and this is this is used as the groups as randomized. So this is a very balanced comparison between the two groups with success rates of 76 versus 54%. I'm sort of belaboring that because as 
many of the surgeons in the audience know there's a great deal of sentiment around the world that this surgery doesn't work. And, and, and I, I kind of wish they would read the papers more carefully <laughs> because the evidence is there. We, um, uh, um, we, we were interested um, in you know, whether people who did cross over had similar outcomes to those who had surgery originally. And, um, and, and it appears to be the case, at least in the Meteor study, 73% um, of those randomized to PT and receiving PT um, uh, had a success. The, of those who um, were randomized to surgery and received surgery, 80% had a success. And of those randomized to PT but who crossed over to have surgery, 81% had a success. So, so it appears that, um, again, going back to that original diagram that, you know, when people are randomized, they go down these two pathways and, um, and, and these three rows account for everybody and they have very similar outcomes, 73 to 81% succeed, but they have very different experiences, right? Everybody in the surgical arm got surgery. Um, two thirds of people in the PT arm did, did not get surgery. My colleague, Lindsay McFarland, did some really nice um, uh, analyses that pursued a question that we, and I think a lot of clinicians are interested in, and that is whether the um, uh, um, advantage of surgery over non-operative therapy might differ according to the extent of degenerative disease. So what Lindsay did here was to use our baseline MRIs to characterize people um, based on the lesions we saw on their MOC scores and uh, standard MRI morphologic um, uh, semi-quantitative reading um, of cartilage bone marrow um, and synovitis, we um, characterized people as having low, medium, or high damage. And on the y-axis, it's the extent of improvement with surgery minus the extent of improvement with PT. So in other words, um, the people in these three groups, some of them got surgery, some of them got PT. In the first group, those who got surgery did better than those who got PT by about 15 points, which is a large number of KUS points. Um, those in the, the middle group by about eight or nine points, which is clinically important. And those in the latter group um, had almost identical outcomes, whether they had surgery or PT. So that reinforced sort of a clinical point that surgery is probably more effective in people who have less um, osteoarthritic change. Um, I mentioned earlier that we followed people out to five years, and you can see that by five years, the three groups, the red being the folks who got surgery immediately, the blue being the folks who got PT and did not have surgery, and the green being the group who crossed over, they end up in the same place. And you can see in the course of the first year that the green group is lagging behind. And what's happening there is they're, they're assigned to PT, they're not doing as well. Um, they Many of them cross over, and by the time they cross over, they sort of join the rest of the group. But here's a, a very interesting um, and somewhat disturbing finding. We're not sure we fully understand this yet, um, that if we look at those three groups again, the top row being those who were assigned to PT and received PT, we find that 2% of them had a knee replacement within five years. Of those who were assigned to PT but crossed over to have surgery, 10% had a knee replacement. And of those who were assigned to surgery and received surgery, 10% had a knee replacement. So a five-fold difference um, in knee replacement rates between those who received surgery and those who, um, who did not. And, um, you know, we've speculated on whether that might have to do with familiarity with surgery that, you know, people, you know, signed up for surgery, had a good experience and were, you know, very agreeable to having another surgery when their knee bothered them um, some more, um, or whether it might have to do, as we saw from the earlier bio cadaver data and some of the you know, open meniscectomy clinical data that, that, that many of us have seen, whether this had to do with um, accelerated damage in the joint in those who had surgery. So the, um, the Finnish group, and I'll show some of the details of their study in a few minutes, the Finnish group did a really nice radiographic follow-up study. And what they're showing us here are on the y-axis are, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, what they're showing us here on the x-axis are the differences in the ORC radiographic score. It's a summary score that assigns points to the number and severity of osteophytes. 
um, in the medial and lateral femur, medial and lateral tibia, um, as well as the summary and severity of joint space narrowing in the medial and lateral compartment. So, um, so the score can range up to about 20, and, um, and they looked at the, uh, the um, ORSI score at baseline in five years later, and they're depicting here the difference. And you can see that the blue bars, which are those who had placebo surgery, this is a placebo-controlled trial, cluster toward the left and the red bars, um, the distribution is more to the right with a, with a, with a pronounced right skew. And, and these results were statistically significant, suggesting that there was greater progression of plain radiographic damage as represented by the ORSI score in the surgical group. We've just finished analyzing some of our um, own um, data, um, uh, it, looking at a very similar phenomenon. So. Um, uh, so we have uh, people, uh, this is a smaller uh, group because we didn't have radiographs on, on everybody and we, we made some exclusions to make the groups a little more comparable. And then we did some adjustment um, using a propensity score and inverse probability weighting to try to refine the adjustment. Um, and the crude and the adjusted results are very similar. So what we looked at were whether our um, surgical group and our PT only group um, uh, worsened in terms of their kelgren lawrence or KL grade and whether they worsen in terms of the ORSI score, which I just described. And then we decompose the ORSI score into the joint space narrowing component and the osteophyte component. And you can see that in the blue rows here, the ORSI score really did um, change more in the APM group. It worsened more in the APM group than in the PT group. And that change was largely due to the osteophyte component, which you can see on the fourth row, those are highly statistically significant differences. They are, you know, adjustment doesn't really change them. Joint space narrowing per se, which is an important part of the KL grade and which was the only part of the, the ORSI joint space narrowing, just kind of subscale that we developed, um, did not, um, uh, uh, there were differences, but they were, they were less um, pronounced. And then um, finally, my colleague, Jamie Collins, um, who's a statistician who's, um, um, developed a lot of expertise in, you know, looking at aggregating uh, MRI scores using MOOCs. Um, Jamie uh, looked at uh, differences in the two groups um, in their um, cartilage damage over uh, time. So what we see is their um, cartilage scores, the MOOCs cartilage scores at baseline at the time of randomization at 18 months when we brought them back in for MRIs and at 60 months. And you can see that the surgical group, which is red, um, worsens uh, as compared with the, much more so than the um, non-operative group, which is blue in the first 18 months. And then the two groups sort of um, worsen at more or less the same rate, which we sort of take to mean sort of the um, sort of uh, um, age-related continued generation and progression of these scores. So what we're seeing is sort of some early worsening that then appears to, to level off. So we were intrigued by the question of whether these differences in uh, that we're seeing on MRI and on, and on radiograph are clinically important. And so we sort of portrayed that as whether the differences that we observed in the, in the first 18 months then were associated with worsening, greater worsening in pain over the subsequent three and a half years. And so what we've depicted on the x-axis here is the extent of worsening in radiographs across all of the meteor subjects I don't, I don't mean radiographs, the extent of worsening in MRI across all of the meteor subjects, the blue group having the least amount of worsening and the green group having the most. And on the y-axis, the extent of worsening in pain between 18 months and, uh, six, and, and, uh, and 60 months. And, and they're identical. So, so it appears that that early worsening is not associated with increasing pain over the subsequent three and a half years. And we've Receive funding to follow this group one last time, another about um, 12 to 14 years out to see whether this phenomenon remains um, sort of um, without a clinical consequence or whether we're starting to see that people who worsened uh, in radiographs, uh, in, in MRI, um, in, in structure early on, uh, end up doing, uh, having, um, you know, worse pain outcomes. And um, so that, that'll be, that'll be, I think, very interesting, but I don't know the answer. Um, oops, sorry, right now. I'm gonna go back now to, to the Finnish placebo control trial. I think this is an extraordinary um, 
trial. And, you know, if any of you haven't seen it, it was a New England Journal study. It came out around Christmas of 2013. I think it's really shaken the landscape. I think it's a beautifully done study. It gets criticized um, uh, often, um, but I, I think unfairly. I think these people were advised by some very, very skilled methodologists. I'm sorry. And so what they did is they um, they identified people who had minimal OA, KL zero to one, who were middle-aged, um, who had meniscal tear on MRI. They brought them to the operating room where they confirmed the tear. If the tear was not confirmed, they were excluded. Um, it was in, in virtually all cases confirmed. And then randomization was done in the OR so that a random half of subjects got the planned arthroscopic partial meniscectomy and the other half had um, their joint lavage, but the meniscus was not touched and then they were followed. And you can see that the trace on the left is a, 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 a um, the Lysholm score, which is a function score and on the right is a pain score that function goes up, pain goes down. Um, the groups are indistinguishable at 12 months. Surgery has a slight advantage in the early months as we've seen before. And so, so just to, to kind of you know, restate the conclusion. So, so as compared with placebo surgery, partial meniscal resection had no advantages in terms of, in terms of pain and, and function. So, um, so maybe we'll just step back because that's a, that's a that's I, I think is a, a sort of a profoundly interesting result. Um, and just think about placebo from a more conceptual standpoint. So, um, so let's imagine a randomized controlled trial in which there are three groups. The first group is followed uh, at the beginning and at the end, but they're otherwise um, paid no attention um, whatsoever. The middle group um, gives, gets a placebo. Um, so let's say this is an osteoarthritis trial and it's a medication, so they get a um, placebo medication. And then the group on the left gets the active medication. And we might end up with results that look like this. So if we're looking at the total um, effect in terms of um, effect and effect size, the, this, it might be, um, you know, kind of large on the left, um, in middle, uh, in the middle one, and then very small on the, on the right. And the question is, how do we interpret this? What was the role of placebo? What's the role of simply participating in a trial? So on the right, these folks improved a little bit. It's often the case that people who participate in some kind of organized study improve probably because of regression to the mean. You sign up for studies in flare and then you settle down. So this is something that's, that's observed frequently. The middle group, in addition to that regression to the mean um, also has an additional benefit, which is depicted on the slide as the placebo group. And then the group on the left, um, you know, goes through the process of taking a medication. They're blinded to whether it's placebo or not. They develop the same expectations, theory would say, as the placebo group, but they also get a real effect of the medication. So that would be called the, the direct um, effect. And so, um, and so if we um, go back to the um, fidelity or the finished study, what we see is they don't have a control group, they just have a placebo and an active group. And so what you can see is that the total effect is substantial. These folks uh, improve by quite a bit. So the total effect is substantial. The direct effect is zero um, because there is no difference between the placebo and the total effect. Now, if the patients themselves, the subjects are queried as to whether they're glad they participated in the study, which they were, they were thrilled because they all got better by a clinically important amount. So what the patient, and they were blinded, so they had no idea whether they had their meniscal, meniscus resected or, or not, but they were sure glad that they participated in the study. And I think that's a very helpful way of thinking that, you know, from a scientific standpoint, we're really very interested in the direct effect because, you know, oftentimes that's where the risk is located um, in taking the active medication. From the patient's point of view, what they experience is the, is the total effect. I, I belabor that a little bit because, again, there's a lot of interest in um, um, uh, not permitting the surgery to, to occur. And I think on the basis of the um, fidelity trial, and I think if you ask the subjects in the fidelity trial, you know, 100% um, um, of them would say, oh my God, no, don't take that away. That was great. I got a lot better, um, even though half of them had placebo. So um, we, we were very intrigued by those observations and uh, also by some work done by uh, a number of colleagues around the world in trying to, um, trying to develop a plausible 
placebo for physical therapy because we were really interested in whether the effects of PT, which are considerable in our studies and in all the studies that I've shown you, the non-operative arms generally, PT arm and generally does very, very well. We're really intrigued about what the active ingredient is. Is it the, the exercises leading to physiologic changes, which then lead to improvements in pain and function? Um, or is it sort of the interpersonal interaction with um, a therapist uh, that you know could be viewed really as a placebo effect. And then we were also interested from just an economic and policy standpoint in whether some of the same effects that you get by um, going to a physical therapist, which requires a dozen sessions and time off of work and, um, and expense, whether um, that could be achieved with a home um, program. And so, um, uh, so we, maybe I'll, I'll just skip this slide. So we developed the um, TEMPO study, which we just completed enrollment um, this past September. This is a large, um, again, NIAMS funded four center um, study that was, that examined these questions of whether the PT effect is largely placebo or contextual and whether, um, you know, leaving your home to come in and receive therapy, whether it's placebo or not, um, is, is, is valuable. And so we randomized 779 subjects and we'll complete our follow-up um, in um, uh, next September. So we probably by about this time next year, we'll have a first order answer um, to the questions that we've posed. Um, it's a forearm trial. The first arm got a home exercise uh, program, which was really very nicely done with a nice colorful pamphlet and a DVD that they got as a link or they got as a thumb drive. We, we give them lots of options. The next arm received that along with some uh, a texting uh, program uh, two or three times a week during the intervention period they got. Um, um, we thought very encouraging, sometimes amusing, um, never you know, insulting texts, nobody seemed to mind them, which we hope you know, um, helped people to remember and to adhere to their exercise. The third arm got all of that, plus they came into for physical therapy, but what they received was a placebo PT. They, um, they got ultrasound with no energy coming out of the probe and they um, got sort of a sham mobilization. Um, and then the fourth arm got um, came in and they got sort of straight up bona fide PT, which was largely strengthening based with some neuromuscular components. So, so we'll see um, what, what, what happens. So, so just to summarize some of the things that I've um, discussed, you know, meniscal tear is a common problem. It's associated with OA. Um, and um, the symptoms appear to be non-specific, which I, I think is, is something that's sort of sobering <laughs> um, in terms of usual clinical practice. Um, that um, that people with this syndrome, whether treated with surgery or PT or with sham surgery, all seem to have rapid sustained pain relief, or at least on average. Um, that the intention to treat findings show that surgery and PT eventuate in similar outcomes at one year with the meta-analysis of those ITT findings showing a slight advantage to surgery, but that crossovers are very common across these trials. Um, and as a consequence, the as-treat analyses or the analyses that take into account crossover um, favor, I would say strongly favor um, surgery. And that um, it appears from our data that delayed surgery may be as effective as immediate surgery, um, although again, now we have non-randomized uh, groups being compared. And so we don't, we don't really know the answer to that, to that question. Um, and then there's this um, very startling observation, I think that, that APM may be no, no more effective than a sham surgical um, procedure. Um, and um, you know, I think what we've observed is that the total effects, if you can remember that conceptual diagram, the total effects, what the patient experiences following sham and following APM are quite large. And because we don't do sham surgery, the only one of those two that we can really offer patients is, um, is APM. You know, I, I think that it, it sort of speaks to the fact that whether the um, mechanism is placebo or not is of great interest to us as clinical scientists, is of little interest to patients um, who really appreciate the benefit. <laughs> um, and then our five-year results, I think the striking finding is that there is this increased risk of total knee replacement that's quite striking in those who were assigned to surgery 
Um, and then the radiographic and the MRI data suggests that while perhaps this is due to people being more comfortable with surgery, it certainly could be due to greater progression of the underlying OA um, as a consequence of surgery. Um, and so where do we land sort of, you know, in terms of what some of the implications are? I, I think I'd be interested in your thoughts that it is reasonable to offer PT as the first line therapy with APM to those who do not respond in pretty much all of the um, sort of decision-making bodies within um, orthopedic surgery across, um, you know, several countries, sports medicine, um, um, osteoarthritis, you know, research society sort of land on that conclusion. Um, we, in terms of research questions, we're very intrigued to know whether the benefits of physical therapy are due to um, the physiologic effects or the placebo effects. Um, we really don't know yet and have just gotten a planning grant to try to begin to investigate whether those who don't improve following PT should be sort of um, uh, directed to surgery or whether an enhanced non-operative regimen might be as effective without posing what we think are perhaps some risks of having surgery. Although again, we don't really um, know whether those risks have real clinical consequences. Um, do the changes that we see really bear upon pain and function, which are the things that probably matter to patients and to their clinicians the most. And then, um, and then I'll close with saying, I, I just don't see the rationale, although th there's a wave sweeping Scandinavia to, um, to sort of take this surgical procedure sort of out of routine clinical practice. And I think it's sort of based on a rather, um, a rather superficial reading of the data that already, um, that already exists in which I've, which I've shown you. So um, I'd be very um, pleased to have any uh, questions. I wanted to close just with a thank you. You know, this kind of work requires a, a high functioning team and we have a wonderful team. I'm really um, blessed to work with some marvelous colleagues at the Brigham and at the centers around the country. And I've listed the um, Tempo centers and the Meteor centers and some of my um, really very special colleagues at the Brigham. Um, so happy to take your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Katz. That was excellent and um, such impressive work. And um, we will have some time for some questions and uh, we'll start with Dr. O'Neill. Thanks, uh, Jeff, that was great. Working? Yeah. Okay, um, so quick question for you. Um, some of the uh, questions you sort of put up on your last slide, I'm just wondering how amenable are those to answering with you know, real word real world evidence. There's a lot of emphasis on that. We recently established a center here devoted to that. You know, there's been work around target trials and things of that nature. Just wondering, where do you see that fitting in as opposed to these expensive, you know, long randomized trials that don't fully answer questions, just lead to more questions? So just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, thank you. You know, the, the, um, um, the, the way that, um, the way that folks have tried to use observational data to answer therapeutic questions is to emulate the randomized control trial. And so it's a, it's a very sophisticated uh, area, sometimes referred to as causal inference um, research that involves taking observational data and imposing upon it some of the entry criteria, the exclusion criteria, being attentive to you know, when the zero time is that observation starts, not allowing for immortal time where people can do poorly, but just by virtue of the way the, way the data that are collected, they're not, they're not penalized, and then using fairly sophisticated adjustment techniques. And there are a number of studies that um, have um, looked at you know, observational data when we have randomized trials to see whether the crude analysis of the observational data gives the same answer as the RCT. It, it, it usually doesn't and sometimes fails miserably. Um, and whether um, using sort of target trial emulation can improve the, um, the, 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 the sort of alignment with the gold standard randomized control trial. And it generally, it generally does, does help a lot. Um, the, there is a difference between um, observational studies done with a protocol. So you have you know, all comers uh, with knee pain and meniscal tear and you sort of follow them at fixed intervals. 
um, and see whether, even though we didn't randomize people as to whether they got surgery or not, we follow them to see how they did. And we try to, as best we can, um, emulate randomization by, uh, and there's a variety of techniques for doing that. Um, that that it tends to work reasonably well. Um, what is often um, kind of referred to when you talk about real world data is this, this sort of elusive promise that in, in, in every medical center, including yours and ours, there is a medical record system. It's often now epic, so it's you know it's the same system across us that that you know, can't we use those data to figure out what's going on? And um, I I think the likelihood that we get unbiased answers is very, very low because you 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 sort of have to Imagine why do people come to see the doctor, you know, or the physical therapist? They they come when you know when their status has somehow changed, and so so what you what you then are sort of looking at are instances where people generally present in flare or they present with problems, um, and then trying to sort of use that as a as a sort of a natural history. So so I think that from my point of view, and this is sort of you know I think most you know, epidemiologists would agree with this, that um, randomization is one of several features that are important for causal inference to be correct. And in the absence of randomization, some of the other things that you can do probably get you pretty close. But when people are followed um, um, at times that are conditioned by their status, um, it's, it's uh, I, I, feel like hopelessly biased. It doesn't mean that that real world data aren't useful for certain things. For example, it captures utilization. So if we want to look at things like racial disparities, um, you know, it's, it's a marvelous place to look because what we're actually seeing is who comes to care, who gets procedures, who doesn't. But if we want to see whether doing a procedure versus doing an alternative procedure or doing nothing at all, um, you know, leads to differential outcomes, I, I think that it, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's unlikely to, to, to produce. And, and in some ways, you know, we're reliving, you know, when I first started during, doing research in the late 1980s, early 1990s was kind of the first renaissance of the observational study that um, gave rise to an awful lot of data and some really incorrect, um, you know, this is, this is why, you know, women of a certain age, many of whom would now be in their 80s and 90s, spent a decade um, on um, hormone replacement therapy, even without symptoms, because it was felt that it would protect their hearts and bones and, you know, actually led to, you know, pulmonary emboli cancer. It's a terrible, terrible uh, consequence of, of observational data um, leading to the incorrect answer. Thanks again. Very thoughtful uh, discussion. Uh, as a group that's um, many of us engaged in this practice of uh, knee arthroscopy. Yes. <laughs> a couple of things that you said were pretty alarming. One is the equanimity, let's say, between lavage and APM. And the other is this notion that perhaps the imaging looks worse in those who have had APM. It leads me to ask you, how comfortable are you that um, the APM that you're talking about is really just APM and maybe not a diverse group of some chondral debridement and other things. Is there, is there anything to be teased apart on the surgical procedures that are part of the conversation? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. We, um, you know, in, in a trial, of course, it's, it's protocolized. So our surgeons, um, you know, met and discussed this very, very carefully and had a uniform um, protocol and they what they did they did no drilling um, they if there were loose sort of debris they kind of cleaned it up and um, uh, so they so so I think the, the big discussion was whether they would do any drilling uh, or any sort of invasive procedures to try to stimulate cartilage and they they did they did not I, I think that it's true though what you say that if you look across sort of um, you know, using claims or other literature, they're, they're, you know, what gets coded as an APM, you know, may represent a variety of different, you know, different techniques. But, um, but, I, but I think in trials, you, you have the ability to, you know, create a, a protocol in terms of even the portals that were used and all of that was, was protocolized. Jeff, thanks again for making these really complex topics uh, understandable. And, 
I'm still hoping my sports medicine guys would teach me how to do an arthroscopy without banging a cartilage. I don't think it's going to happen in my career. Um, my, my question is, how can we apply some of the principles of, of precision medicine? We talked a bit about this yesterday, but precision medicine to look more granularly at things like radiomics. So, for example, the alignment of the knee, the pattern of the menis meniscal tear, uh, some other uh, features, genomics, transcriptomics. How can you apply these precision medicine principles to maybe figure out which approach is right for which patient? Because when we look at averages, I think we, um, I, I appreciate the power, the power of randomization, but at the same time, when we look at averages, what we really should be looking at is the scatter plot. And some patients get much better, some patients get much worse. And how can we predict which ones might follow which path? So I, I think there's two pieces to that. The first is, you know, um, should, you know, as outcomes, should we look at group means or at uh, individuals? And, and I think we should look at both. And I think the FDA, for example, and drug trials requires you to look at both. So, so, um, so when we create something like a success criterion, um, you know, that's applied at the individual level, right? So a certain, so when, when results are, are, are presented in terms of percentages, what you're generally looking at is individual level differences, you know, so three quarters of people improved versus 50% improved with a, you know, confidence interval around the different, around the interval and that. So, so I don't, I, I think that, that, uh, that that sort of, you know, exists and is done fairly routinely. The reason that actually we, um, end up with these group means, they, they're meaningful in their own way, but they also are so much more powerful statistically. And so trials that are powered on the basis of um, differences in percentiles, um, you know, are um, require much greater samples because, you know, somebody who improves by 25 points and somebody who improves by 12 points are both counted as success if the criterion is 10 or more, right? So you lose a lot of variability when you look at individual level differences. And so, so they're very complementary approaches. And, and what, what I've tended to favor is to power based on group differences, just to make the studies a little bit more reasonable in terms of sample size, but then to report both. And, and most journals will, will ask that you do that as well. In terms of whether there are, um, how to make sense of sort of the many, many individual factors. Um, again, just from an epidemiologic standpoint, when, when you look at two groups who are randomized, and um, let's say that we, for a moment, are looking at um, at individual level data. So we say that surgery, you know, 70% of people got better um, and non-operative therapy, 50% of people got better. And we say, well, what about um, a particular genotype or just their race or their degree of osteoarthritic change? Th that is what is generally described as effect modification or an interaction. And in a sense, you take your two by two table, success versus failure, surgery versus not, and you now create two two by two tables. So we go from four cells to eight. We would say in people with mild OA, we have success versus not, surgery versus not, and people with moderate to severe OA. And if you added another criterion to it, you can see that you begin to, uh, you would use multivariate analysis, um, which takes care of some of that. But at the end of the day, it's very, very um, demanding again of sample size to do subgroup analyses. And so, so precision medicine is kind of, um, you know, kind of a, a term that's used presently, but this has been around forever. And it really, in the context of trials, is what we're talking about are subgroup analyses, which have to be um, planned a priori, and which again, really drive up sample size. What a lot of folks are very interested in doing, and we've done a lot of this ourselves, is to take um, cohorts that only get let's say surgery, and you ask, well, you know, we could select patients a lot better if we knew which factors were associated with better scores following surgery. And, and what you would tend to find out, for example, we've done this in Meteor, if you look at the surgical group, the people who do better are people who have less OA, who are younger, who have less depression. Um, let, let's say, I, we, that's more or less what we found. The problem is that if you um, look at the non-operative arm and ask who does better, you find the exact same things. People with less OA um, who um, do not have depression, who are younger, tend to do better. And so I don't think you learn anything about 
selection. Um, it does because it's so. In other words, it didn't help. What what we can say to people who have milder OA, who have depressive symptoms, and who are um, uh, who don't have depressive symptoms, and who are younger, is that no matter which arm you go down, you're likely to do a little better than people who don't have those characteristics. But it doesn't help us to choose. So so I think that that really, in order to improve patient selection, you want to do it in a trial context. Um, or in a comparative context um, where you're looking at subgroup analyses, uh, which is very, very, um, which consumes a lot of sample size. So, so I, I didn't mean to make it a complicated explanation, but I, I think this is something that, so there's a great deal of interest and there's a great deal of promise in some of the precision mechanism medicine techniques. But at the end of the day, there are just these stark ep epidemiologic realities that what you're talking about are subgroup differences um, and they consume a lot of, they consume a lot of power. And so, um, and without, and, and, and the, the, the single arm cohort studies don't help you select patients. They help you tell people who are committed to a pathway, how likely is it that you're going to succeed on that pathway, which for patients who are committed to the pathway is very helpful information, and it is to their physicians as well. But it doesn't inform the question of whether they should choose that pathway or the alternative pathway. So, 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 th so I think it's a complicated question, but I, I, so I guess maybe I hold out a little less promise that you know, being able to measure these things will actually help us to select patients than, than many, many people do, just having dealt with a lot of these data. All right. Um, I think we'll wrap sure. up there. Uh, but Dr. Katz, thank you so much. And um, thank you to the CCMBM for um, coordinating this event. And uh, thanks for making the trip out. This was excellent. And appreciate it.